This talk is really a displaced talk from Monday morning session uh, on uh, biomechanics and basic sciences. And uh, since yesterday morning was so far away, I thought I'd go through a couple of things that were discussed uh, at that time. Dr. Alexander, uh, Professor Alexander talked about uh, the springs uh, in the kangaroo ligaments and other ligaments. Uh, Adams talked about passive extension movements uh, and mechanics in the system and the stored energy in both the muscles and ligaments. Um, Willard uh, talked about the bones floating in a soft tissue envelope, so that these bones were just floating there. Uh, Zing talked about six degrees of freedom in the pelvis and uh, minimal energy uses in maximal, uh, maximization concepts in developing models. Um, and he also pointed out that the sacrum moves in three dimensions, uh, three rotations, and three planes. Uh, Fleming, Willard, and uh, Snyders, and Grekovetsky all talked about some cross-hatching mechanisms of the muscles and ligaments and structures and forces within the body. Um, and Snyders also talked about the click-clack phenomenon that he saw. Um, Fleming and Wiganen uh, talked about the integration of limbs and spinal movement. And Grekovetsky talked about the spinal engine and helical movement. And they all talked about the integration of these mechanical events within the human structure. And what I want to do is try and give you a mechanical structure that will model this human structure, and in fact, all biologic structure. The actual talk is supposed to be on how do we stabilize the, sta uh, the sacrum in 3D space. Well, the standard model for what we talk about in the humans, of course, is the uh, column of blocks and uh, standing up there being supported by its, its weight. And of course, in my neighborhood, which is Washington, D.C., the model for a column is this thing here. And we recognize that the base is held by the massive load of the stones above it, crushing down on this base, holding it in a, actually, it's a form-fit concept with this whole weight supporting, being supported by this base. It is immobile, rigid, unable to do anything but stay right where it is. It's 33 feet thick on the bottom and two feet thick on the top. Um, and you can't turn that upside down, of course, because it will just crush its point. Now, sometimes we look, our spines might look like uh, columns, uh, so that we can have a, a concept that it might be a column, and that's what we look at. And if you make it out of stone, even as beautiful as this is, it's still stone, and it still doesn't move, and it still stays right where it is. As soon as you try and balance out this flexible column, you get in all sorts of trouble. And this one who is trying to balance out the uniform of a German soldier. Um, columns have particular uh, biomechanical uh, qualities, and you can't vary them. You just can't turn the damn things any way but a column, the way a column is supposed to be. So if you turn it upside down, most columns don't work very well. And arches certainly don't work very well. So you can't conceive of the sacrum as a keystone in an arch because it can't accept in certain postures. And so you have to reconsider that it might be something else. As soon as you tilt that base in a column, that column not only falls over, but shears, tears itself apart from its own weight. Um, so, and not only that, but that no longer becomes the base of that column because the column doesn't exist. Horizontally, it's very difficult to conceive of a uh, column of uh, disjointed, structures that are held together by a force mechanism, you can't, this is no longer a column, this is a beam, and a beam doesn't have a base. Columns are immobile. Human bodies are mobile. Columns are unidirectional in, in the gravity force. Biologic systems are omnidirectional and can be used in any position. Columns depend on the weight of gravity to hold it in place. Human bodies and other animals can exist in space and in water and work perfectly well, no matter which way you turn it. 
And in fact, it's quite evident that this is no longer a column and this is no longer a column. So I think we are going to have to consider what seems to be obviously a column to us uh, because we look at it that way, but as Dr. Mooney has said, uh, it may look like a duck, but it doesn't quack like a duck, it doesn't walk like a duck, and it doesn't fly like a duck, it's not a duck. Certainly when you put it in a horizontal position, that sacrum will fall right out of that pelvis. Well, how does it stay in place? Well, uh, we talked about the, uh, the six degrees of freedom. What you have is three rotations around three axes and translations into three planes. Actually, I like to think of it as 12 because you can go positive and negative in each one of these. So you're one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you end up with 12 degrees of freedom if you count the positive and negative uh, in a Cartesian co coordinate system. It's logical to assume that if you have 12 degrees of freedom, you have 12 restraints that are necessary to keep it in place. Buckminster Full approved this by having one restraint, and this is a tension restraint, and you have a pendulum so you can swing around and you can rotate around, uh, hanging from one restraint. When well, you have two restraints, but uh, these, these structures that are the restraints would be isotonic and isometric. They stay the same length, the same tension. And you will, can rotate around an axis and translate in a plane. When you have three points, you tend to be really much more confined and can only move, translate actually back and forth in plane along a single line. When you put four points together in a particular, com uh, uh, as a, built as a tetrahedron with the vertices corresponding to the tension elements, you will get a fixed point in space. That fixed point still can rotate, though, in sort of turbines, even though these will remain at, at the same length and same tension, isometric and isotonic. If you keep on with that story, you end up with 12, a minimum of 12 points holding the structure at that point in space, and it will have to be 12 points. And those 12 points correspond to the vertices of an icosahedron. Familiar structure to you that would fit that concept is a bicycle wheel. You need a minimum of 12 spokes on a bicycle wheel. That will hold that hub in, in space, steadily in space, no movement at all, and you can turn it in any direction. It takes a tremendous amount of force. It is mobile, uh, essentially omnidirectional, uh, stable in space, and local load distributing. So you can take that wire and, and take the load that's on that bicycle and distribute it through the rim. And you can hook the two bicycle rim, uh, wheels together so they complement each other and distribute the load even further. Um, such a structure is known as a tensegrity structure. And it's a word coined by Buckminster Fuller, the uh, originator of that, and the geodesic dome, which is also a tensegrity structure and a uh, icosahedron. Uh, and it's a word that means tension integrity. He played with these words. Tom Dorman plays with similar kinds of words, uh, Poussin and a few other words. But it's the same type of thing. So it's a made up word that he uses for of uh, tension integrity structure, which means there's a continuous tension, but the compression elements may be floating within that tension element. So we have a bicycle wheel now model that I'm using for the sacrum and stability of the sacrum. And what we can do here is stabilize that sacrum with 12 uh, tension elements, and you can pick them. There are plenty of those things. And because the human being and bicycles make a few extra ones, you get a false safe kind of mechanism, so you got a lot of these things going on. And rather than think of this as the base of a column, I would like to think of it as the hub of activity and what we are doing instead of leveling a base, maybe balancing the hub and the wheel. Well, once I got stuck in space, I had to figure out how to move it. And what you do is, you, well, let's go backwards again. We can get it to turbine by changing some of the tension in some of the elements that are holding this in, in place. So you can use the muscles that'll tighten things or positioning. And you can get it to piston back and forth, if, if not turbine. So you can get it to move 
back and forth within the pelvis. Okay. But there's another way of doing it, and you can keep the structures, the tension elements isometric and isotonic. And all you have to do is take that rim and twist the rim. And as you twist the rim, you'll get a tilting of that hub, and it'll go click, clack, back and forth as you twi twist it. Uh, notice those crossed elements in the wire. I was fascinated by those crossed elements uh, of, the, of the tension elements because that's repeated over and over again in all the lectures you've heard, and, uh, and this is Kapenji showing the mechanics of it. Again, Grekovetsky and also Fleming and also uh, anybody else you want to talk about who's been talking about these things, you see. And it's a hierarchical system, so it's not only at the top systems, but you also get it at every layer you look on down, as Willard pointed out, that you will see this as these layers, you will look at them and see them. And the not only the structure there, but the mechanics there, as pointed out by Grekovetsky. And you can get all the way down to the disk, and the same kind of thing happens, and probably happens at the cellular and subcellular level, too. It'll work its way down in this cross-hatching pattern. Well, as an old, uh, let me rephrase that, former knee surgeon, I remember the cross-hatching mechanisms of the cruciate ligaments in the knee. And this has a particular kind of movement pattern. This is the, uh, another one of my toys, is the Jacob's Ladder. This is a 2,000-year-old biblical toy, um, a tensegrity structure, my add, because it's all connected by tension elements. And you can get this thing going up and down using this system and it goes click, clack, click, clack, click, clack, like that, through the tension elements. And it can be done in any direction you choose. You can go from bottom up to top down, and you can turn it any way you want, and it still works perfectly well. Well, that's coupled motion, as you saw going up and down, and that coupled motion was described by Lovett and Fryett and lots of others, and also uh, the click-clack motion is, was noisily obvious. I, got, I missed one there. Okay. Well, that crossing mechanism is well seen throughout the body. It, it not only is in the spine, but goes out to the limbs. I already showed it to you in the knee. Here is in the Y ligament of the hip, and it's also in all the leg muscles. This is showing a jumping frog using his muscles isometric and isotonic but the sartorius and the peroneus and all those, and you can, you can see it in, in many of the muscles and ligaments uh, from one end of the other to, of the body to the fingers, up and down, all the way around. So how do we wind up this clock and our spring? Well, all we do is have to twist that sacrum a little bit. And you do that by walking. That gives that pelvis a twist that tilts that sacrum and gets that going click, clock, click. And it does that in three dimensions because of the Trendelenburg kind of thing that you do when you walk from side to side. And the sum total of the movement is helical, as described by Grekovetsky and many others. Uh, this is from White and Punjabi. So you get a spirally motion going up the system and merrily dancing along uh, the rocks going up the spine and out the limbs being projected from the central core out is Grekovetsky shows in his spinal engine. It's essentially the dog, the tail wagging the dog. And I put this in just to remind me to talk about the pelvic ligaments. It's probably, in my mind, controlled by the pelvic diaphragm. And the easiest way to check what's going on, in my mind, in the pelvis and sacroiliac joints is to do a rectal examination and check some of the ligaments from the inside. It's diagnostic. The ultimate of these tension wheels is the tension icosahedron. It's a structure hierarchical, independent of gravity, um, local load distributing, so it'll distribute the load around it. The bones float in this tension network. You can make it into long columns as you like that go click, clack, click, clack from one end to the other. And essentially, this was described by Ezekiel. Thank you very much. <laughs>